The Asus RTX 3070 Strix has produced thus far the most interesting overclocking performance out of the box, but also it's provided some valuable insight into how Ampere behaves. Specifically, we can look at the GPU boosting behavior, frequency versus temperature, and power budget, and take a few things away with how Nvidia has shaped this generation. However, at $600, 100 over MSRP and 100 below the 3080, and somewhat nearby where the 6800 XTs are supposed to start, it gets kind of difficult to justify something like an Asus Strix in a 3070 class of hardware. But we're still going to review this because it's still an interesting piece of hardware, and the quality is there. Just the value is a bit more nebulous. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair 4000D Airflow case. We recently reviewed the Corsair 4000D Airflow as a return to high-performance cases by Corsair but also talked about its attention to detail on color matching the individual components of the case. The 4000D Airflow is marketed as an affordable, performance-focused chassis with ease of installation features like refined cable management routing and pathways. Learn more about the Corsair 4000D Airflow at the link in the description below. So first off, sorry for an RTX 3070 review. We are ramping into the Zen 3 CPU reviews. This will be one of the last GPU content pieces we do for a little while, although we do have teardowns ready. Those will go up sometime. Uh, around when this does, but it's dying off at this point. We're moving on to CPUs, but this one's interesting to look at. So uh, the Asus RTX 3070 Strix is a three fan design. It actually has alternating fan flow directions. There's two V BIOS options, and it has one of the most aggressive fan curves we've seen on a 30 series card yet. That means it runs louder out of box, but also that it runs cooler. And this combined with the lifted power limits means higher sustained frequencies in gaming and testing. The card additionally has good attention to detail on troubleshooting features like highlighted ground 12v1, 12v2, 3.3 volt, and GP read points on the back of the PCB in order to quickly identify problems. We have a separate teardown on this card that'll be going up as well, showing some of the detail of the heatsink design and cooler design and uh, the mechanics of it and why it worked out the way it did. So if you have issues with your card working at some point though, just marking these read points is very helpful in the troubleshooting procedure. All the cards have the ability, obviously, for you to stab them with a digital multimeter. That's sort of a passive ability, it's just there. But actually pinpointing spots on the card is helpful for either modding, overclocking, or again, just troubleshooting to make sure the card's not fully dead. The cost of this card is absolutely the biggest issue with it. It's, uh, in a sense, it's fair versus the other cards in the stack, but that doesn't mean you should buy it. It just means that the price isn't there for no reason. It, you do actually get better performance out of the card and a better card for it, but $100 is a lot when you're talking not a flagship. It's below the flagship. It's two steps below the top of the line card, and it's also below one of AMD's high-end gaming flagship competitors. So that's the the difficult point for most people to get over, but we're still gonna go through all the numbers today and take a look at the Asus Strix. We'll start with the Strix 3070's strongest point, overclocking, in an actually interesting way. This card has the best overclocking we've seen yet on any of our RTX 30 series cards so far, including power modded RTX 3090s, by the way. We have a few things to walk through in our OC stepping table, which is how we take notes on an overclock while doing testing. The first three rows are from TimeSpy non-extreme, which didn't produce enough load to actually benefit from overclocking because the GPU was around 90 to 92% load. Honestly, it was just a mistake running non-extreme, but we left the data in because it's sort of interesting to see. We switched to extreme after that. You can see in row six that we held 2040 megahertz full stock while the card was still warming up, so only 58 degrees. After a few more seconds of running, it hit 61 degrees and dropped 15 megahertz showing us the value of every couple degrees with NVIDIA's architecture. That's with fan ramp too. So it's going up in fan speed, up in temperature obviously, because this is only the first maybe minute or so of the test, and the clocks are dropping as a result, as is naturally expected. In row eight, we increased the power target and did nothing else other than letting the auto fan speed continue to self-regulate, and this did nothing for clocks until row nine, where we slid the voltage slider all the way to the right. We used to call this the placebo slider, but it seems like, with Ampere at least, it actually really does something. This changed the limit to idle, and the clocks boosted back to 2040 megahertz, while at the same temperature with no other changes. 
So this actually does do something now, and that unfortunately kills the fun name of Placebo Slider. Ultimately, you can see our shock when the card was still stable at 2175 megahertz, and we ended up settling on about 160 megahertz GPU offset or 2175 megahertz core. We settled on 500 to 600 megahertz offset for memory. The memory on this card, unfortunately, wasn't very good, but the core is excellent. And of course, keep in mind that the memory is G6, not G6X, which does affect its behavior and frequency capabilities as well. This plot compares the out-of-the-box frequency of the ASUS ROG Strix card and the NVIDIA RTX 3070 FE card. The ASUS Strix Performance vBIOS plots a perfectly straight line, which is ideal, but very rare to find post-GPU Boost 2.0 era, and we're well past that era. The frequency is dead steady at 20-25 MHz for the entire test, with no fluctuation or frequency decay due to thermals or power. This is exciting to see, and irrespective of individual silicon quality, does mean that the card will be easier to overclock. Plotting the NVIDIA Founders Edition card next, we see its weakness versus these partner models. Impressively, but in a suboptimal way, the FE card fluctuates and falls from 1965 MHz at the outset to 1890 to 1905 MHz after steady state is hit. As a refresher, this is from GPU boost behavior, where frequency is contingent upon power limits then thermals, where every couple degrees is worth 10 to 15 megahertz, and then things like voltage reliability and voltage supply. This puts the Strix card as superior to the FE card in a significant way. Here's a pressure map of the Asus RTX 3070 Strix compared to the RTX 37 Founders Edition. The FE card, at the time we tested it, had the best coverage we've seen yet using our new pressure mapping system. Much of that was thanks to the metal shroud that secured against the backplate to straighten out the card. This 3070 Strix is close and keeps good contact over the GPU. It has gaps in coverage only in the top left of the die here, and overall ASUS seems to have fairly even pressure coverage on its RTX 3070 Strix. So this indicates good contact of the cooler and is a part of why the cooler is performing well, which you'll see momentarily. Here's the cold plate flatness map. As a reminder, this is measured with a special instrument that takes point to point measurements of cold plate depth measured against a known zero point. The goal is a small box with whiskers that don't deviate too far from it, but the box density is most important. Maintaining a closer together cluster means better consistency point to point, which is what we want to see. The Strix does fine here. It's not as good as the 3070 FE was for at least our unit, but it's around where the 3080 Tough plotted, and that's okay overall. It's definitely on the better side. Noise normalized thermals are next, and the ASUS card should do comparatively well versus the FE card in this test. Noise normalizing controls the fan speed so that all cards produce equivalent noise in a standardized test environment, which allows us to see whose cooler truly is best. That said, we're not power normalizing here, so there's one variable that you'll need to think about while we go through the numbers. For GPU thermals, the ASUS RTX 3070 Strix measured 62 degrees Celsius in a 21 degree ambient environment while under a power virus workload. The 3070 Founders Edition card ran 65 degrees in this test, but also consumed significantly less power. The Strix's vBIOS, both the Performance vBIOS and the Quiet vBIOS, pulled 276 watts versus 227 on the FE. The ASUS card is therefore outperforming the FE card while even consuming 50 watts more power, making it significantly better. We're looking next at VRM MOSFET and memory measurements when the cooler is normalized to 40 dBA. The Strix card measured 55 degrees Celsius for a MOSFET in the center of the VRM, which is well within spec and nearly 20 degrees better off than the FE card. For the memory modules, we measured the top center module and a bottom module near the PCIe slot. In both instances, the measurement was about the same. 51 degrees for the bottom module, and 49 degrees for the top module. The FE card plotted about 53 and 60 degrees for those units. Both are within spec and technically fine, but the Strix card is undoubtedly in an objectively better position, especially when considering there's a higher source of power adjacent to the memory. And that's in the form of 50 watts more feeding into the GPU. For auto thermals, the ASUS card's results will not change versus the previous charts, but everyone else's will. That's because ASUS was already running its vBIOS at the noise level we normalized to. But this also means that ASUS is running louder out of box than most of the other cards, which is a potential downside for users who aren't willing to manually control fan speeds. Q-Mode did not change fan speed in FurMark, but it did result in a 200 RPM reduction in 3 Mark, and we'll talk about those numbers momentarily. In this test, the RTX 3070 FE ran a lower fan speed than we thought necessary. The ASUS card is running a higher one than is necessary. The card stuck to around 33 dBA for the 3070 FE 
for complete auto control, which follows its VBIOS temperature target of 75 degrees in this workload. The Strix runs about 13 degrees cooler when fully auto controlled, and that's with a higher power target, but it's also running 7 to 8 dBA louder. So, the takeaway here is if you have an FE card, you could probably set a more aggressive fan curve and likely not notice it too much. If you have a Strix card, you could reduce the fan speed and not pay too much in terms of your frequency reduction. Finally, for the thermal section, here's the memory and VRM MOS thermals when compared at auto. Again, the Strix has not changed, but the rest have. The RTX 3070 FE held an 82 degrees Celsius VRM MOS measurement for the hotspot VRM components that we found with memory thermals at 61 and 69 for the top and bottom memory modules. The bottom memory module tends to run the hottest in most cards, which is because it's right up against the slot and has no real room for air to escape. The Strix card held 55 degrees and 49 to 51 here, demonstrating that its advantages grow as the noise levels deviate from a normalized level. We noted in our 3070 FE review that Nvidia should be running its FE fans about 1 to 2 dBA more aggressively, going by our testing methods and distances, just to get MOSFET thermals back into safer territory. They're fine right now, but when introducing the card into a hot case with a higher internal ambient, say 30 or 40 C, the MOSFET temperature will rapidly ramp into territory where we're not really that comfortable. The next chart looks at auto fan behaviors and hysteresis, or the lag time between PWM response and thermal triggers. In a fire strike looping frame render, the auto configuration for PBIOS hits about 61 degrees right away, at which point the fan freaks out and overcompensates to try and hit and hold its lower temperature target of about 58 to 59 in this workload. The fan overcompensates by going from 0 to 1500 RPM in a span of just 21 seconds from the load starting, which is very noticeable to the user. Rapid change is what humans, I'm told, notice the most, whereas a gradual ramp is less noticeable to humans. VBIOS and the controllers quickly realize that the fan hit too hard, and it spends the next 340 seconds slowing back down to 1300 RPM, then slowly ramping again to 1400 RPM. This erratic behavior was reproduced in a couple of task passes. It could be improved by ASUS. It eventually holds that 1400 number. Uh, and again, remember that this target is different than what we showed in Fermark due to differences in programming between software tests and drivers. But we'd like to see a less panicky ramp at initial load. The QBIOS does the same thing, just to a lesser degree. In the Fermark Power Virus test, QBIOS and PBIOS held about the same fan RPM, again, due to the workload. But in 3D Mark, the QBIOS runs 1200 RPM rather than 1400 RPM, and that has them at about 37 dBA for the PBIOS and 33.5 for the QBIOS. This chart shows the fan speed in RPM versus the noise level as measured at a 20 inch distance. We'll look at the fan percentage comparisons next, as we've had some trouble with PWM on the ASUS ROG Strix. As shown here, the 800 RPM speed was right around our noise floor and so we were unable to get the test resolution required to go below about 860 RPM on the Strix card. It's functionally silent at this point anyway, and anything else in the average residential home will be louder. The maximum noise level we measured was 57.8 dBA at 100% fan speed, or 3000 RPM on all fans. You'd only hit this speed if manually configured, and it seems to be about the same place all the other cards have recently maxed out when we've tested. The 40 dBA point is at about 68% speed, which is roughly where the card ran when auto-controlled in Fermark. Progression across the curve is relatively predictable point to point, and each of these speeds is in roughly 5% steps. PWM was a bit funny on this card. The way PWM signaling scales, we basically got no value below 50% fan speed, as the card was already at around its limits. Most cards tend to hit this point at 30% fan speed. The end result is that there's larger steps between every percentage point, and so the ability to finely tune fan speed is somewhat lost on this card. You'd ideally make use of the entire range before falling below the PWM limit where the fans stop spinning, as that allow users to better tune the fan profile. This comes down to how PWM is programmed in the card, and we think it'd be an easy point of improvement for ASUS in the future. This isn't a big deal, but if more granularity can be had for something relatively simple, it seems worthwhile. Our power testing is conducted using a special interposer to benchmark total board power. So this isn't total system power and is thus more accurate to the card's behaviors exclusively. We're measuring all the rails into the card as well. Both the performance and quiet VBIOS for the Strix 3070 pulled about 276 watts in Furmark at 4K, with any differences purely variance run to run or in averaging. 
the power budget is the same. It's just the fan curve that changes. Overclocking the 3070p BIOS to max pushed it up to somewhat insane 344 watts, which aligns with the 25% power slider offset correctly. That's about the same level of power as the 3080 Tough, and not distant from the 3090 FE stock power draw of 358 watts. It's definitely inefficient, given the GPU's hardware limitations when you compare it to the full or fuller sized 3090 GPU, but it's still the most you can get out of a 3070. The 3070 FE, for reference, pulled about 248 watts overclocked and 225 watts stock. In Total War Three Kingdoms, just for a gaming representation, the 3070 Strix card pulled about 257 to 258 watts ahead of the 3070 FE stock by nearing 30 watts. Although efficiency goes down with more power on amp here, that does imply more overclocking headroom at the top end. The OC pushed only 266 watts here due to limitations with how games behave as opposed to something like Furmark, which is a power virus. We'll just show some quick gaming benchmarks to put this in perspective. Again, for the full RTX 3070 performance, check our review on the 3070 FE because gaming, it's not really worth running the full gaming suite against board partners when they're as close as they are. Check the FE review for all of that. In Total War Three Kingdoms at 1080p Ultra, where even the 3080 is binding performance of the CPU, the 3070 Strix on its stock PBIOS did 109 FPS average. It improved by 6.7% to 116 FPS with an overclock. That's actually a huge uplift just from an overclock on this generation, sadly, despite previous generations gaining a lot more. The end result is performance that has stock PBIOS equal to the RTX 3070 FE's overclock performance and Strix OC performance that's nearly 2080 Ti performance. At 1440p in the same test, the Strix 3070 with its stock PBIOS did 70 FPS average, just past the 3070 FE's overclock performance. Overclocking the Strix got it up to 77 FPS average, past the 2080 Ti, and behind the 2080 Ti OC. The 3080 FE only, in air quotes there, leads by 20% when compared to the Strix OC performance, but considering the Strix is $600 instead of five, the 3080 is still significantly advantaged. It doesn't always help to have higher clocks, unfortunately. In Red Dead 2 at 4K, the 3070 Strix held 66 FPS average with both OC and stock performance. That said, you can see the 0.1% improvement with the overclock, it's just that the averages didn't show any change. Improvement versus the FE was about 5% here, amounting to just 3 FPS. So that's it for the 3070 Strix. Uh, these cards we are again winding down on. We do have an MSI card, we've got a colorful card. The MSI is a 3080, colorful is a 3070, but we've already done some overclock testing on the latter of those. And we have a couple other cards, this isn't literally one or two other cards that we could work on. But just personally, I would like to get away from GPUs and work on something else. So we're going to be looking at CPUs in the Ryzen 5000 series for quite a while. And uh, again, we're trying to ramp back into some case and cooler stuff in between all of that. So check back for more as always. Thank you for sticking with us and bearing through the GPU reviews. But hopefully all this stuff is out there for when you are ready to buy a card and help you determine whether or not it's actually worth it. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net. Helps out directly. Uh, like by buying one of our brand new GN Bar Runner bar mats, or go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.